This is Election 2020, New Mexico House District 33. I'm Fred Martino, KRWG Public Media and the League of Women Voters pleased to present today's forum. The rules are simple. Candidates have up to 60 seconds to answer each question and should not mention their opponent in the answer. My co-host from the League is Vicki Simons, and we welcome candidates Michaela Cadena and Beth Miller. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the first question will begin with Michaela. In what ways, if any, should the tax system in New Mexico be reformed? Explain. Good afternoon, Fred, and thank you to you, KRWG, and the League of Women Voters for hosting this conversation. I absolutely believe that as a voting democracy, we all deserve to have honest and accurate conversations with those we elect and send into office. I'm proud of my freshman term to both serve on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Tax and Revenue Committee. Fundamentally, our tax system um, has some work that needs to be done. We need more equity in our GRT system. We also need more equity in the ways that we collect personal income tax and corporate income tax. And I'm well positioned to be setting a platform and legislative leadership to do so, um, thinking of our District 33 families and the families across New Mexico that deserve better. Thank you. Beth, your thoughts. Uh, should the tax system in New Mexico be reformed? Any ideas on that? Absolutely. You know, on any given day, families are sitting down and they're trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And they're asking themselves, uh, what's the top priority? Should we buy groceries? Should we include new school clothes? Or, or is there enough money even to take a small vacation? And in order to uh, provide a solution to these questions that they have daily, we must modify or eliminate the pyramid taxing on the GRT. By the way, this GRT has not been addressed since 2016. The antiquated GRT hinders our businesses and stifles their ability uh, to prosper, as well as putting, putting additional heavy taxes on our taxpayers. And we don't need to forget about our retirees, you know, our grandmothers, our grandparents, the widow next door, who is paying double taxes on their social security. New Mexico is one of 13 states who apply this social security tax. And um, okay. I believe- thank, thank you, Beth. And you'll have a chance to talk more about that. Vicki? First of all, I'd like to thank you and KRWG for producing this program and thank the, the candidates for participating. It's great. Um, Beth, I guess you already just answered this, but I'll ask you anyway. Should New Mexico continue to tax Social Security ben benefits and explain? Thank you so much for allowing me to continue my thought. Uh, as a retiree, I also experienced the double taxation on my Social Security and that of my husband. And it concerns me greatly that the high cost of living is rising and the tax the Social Security is not matching up to that. I'm concerned that our retirees are struggling more and more every day just because of this one tax. Second of all, I believe by eliminating the Social Security tax, we will entice uh, new retirees from other states to look at New Mexico as calling home here in our state. And I believe our state can be a more attractive place for those people as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Michaela, the same question. Should New Mexico continue to tax Social Security benefits? Explain. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, Micaela. And Michaela, okay. <laughs> Micaela, yes, yes. I think names are important. They honor who we are and our families and where those incredible legacies came from. So I appreciate the time and intention to figure out mine. Um, as I've said previously, I do serve on New Mexico's House and Taxation Committee, the Taxation and Revenue Committee. In this position, um, I've certainly been part of bipartisan debates and bipartisan efforts to think about how we show up for our New Mexicans, for our families, for our small businesses, and certainly for our local economies. Um, this bill is, uh, or this proposal, is much more complex than what we've heard in the media or otherwise. What's really important to name is that all retirees do not go into the end of their life with the same access to income and financial protections that, that some folks do in New Mexico. 
we already have in place protections so that our lowest income seniors do not pay tax on their social security. What's real in that proposals prevented previously and those I voted on meant that New Mexicans, even in their retirement, earning hundreds of thousands of dollars would not be taxed. Okay, when we're, I think we're out of, we're out of time. Enough, we're out of time on that question. We're gonna move on now. Starting pay for teachers is nearly 20% lower in New Mexico as compared to districts in El Paso, which start at more than $50,000 a year. Micaela, how do you assess efforts to make the state's salaries more competitive? Certainly, thank you, Fred. I'm mayor in the New Mexico legislature in that my first years and in my freshman term, I was the only woman in the New Mexico house that still had little ones, kids at home. I, I have them home today. Unless um, they calmly pay attention to my stern looks, they will likely make an appearance during this video interview. Both of my parents were classroom teachers. I know that the work that our educators and staff do every day is heroic. We feel that more than ever as we move through this global pandemic. I voted in favor of and certainly support um, the efforts coming both from the governor's office and the legislature to invest in a moonshot. Our kids deserve education. A beginning step towards that is equity and pay for our educators and, and school staff that certainly deserve to be in our home community serving our kids that need that instead of crossing state borders like we often see here in Las Cruces or the southern part of New Mexico. So we got to find the money. We got to fund education in a real and meaningful way. Thank you, Beth. Yes, Fred, thank you so much for this question because this hits very dear to my heart. My husband started out his career in the classroom and ended his uh, years as, as an administrator. And I remember those years struggling to make ends meet as uh, our young couple, you know, uh, back in those days, and I guess I'm telling my age, uh, we're talking about eight, seven, $9,000 a year <laughs> and uh, starting a new family, that was difficult. But I believe that we have the system, we have the state schools that can provide the quality education for quality teachers. We do need to meet and match uh, our competitors. You know, many times during those years that my husband was working so hard to teach the children, a lot of the supplies came out of our own pocket. And that made our budget even harder to deal with. So we need to find it like, uh, like has been suggested, that there are ways that we can match and meet the needs of our students. I also believe that we need to give our teachers, our new teachers, uh, incentives to stay in our state. Many, okay. of, many of them are leaving. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Vicki. Uh, Beth, next question. Are you satisfied with how much money was allotted, uh, allocated to the early Childhood Trust Fund in the 2020 legislative session? Explain. Um, you know, we're talking about early childhood. I believe that every dollar that goes to a child in education is worth the dollar spent. I believe it's important for us to target special interest uh, of those who need it the most. Um, we have students who have well, healthy families who support them. And then we have other families who don't have the same uh, eco economic and um, daily education. So I think that it's important for us to spend that money and, and I see that we have. And so we need to continue to develop that whole process. Thank you. Thank you. Michaela, the same question to you. Are you satisfied with how much money was allocated to the Early Childhood Trust Fund in the 2020 legislative session? Explain. As it happens, I am sitting in a legislative interim committee or was this morning um, and realized they just came back from lunch. So uh, here I am trying to manage all the responsibilities. Um, this question is really important and close to my heart. Uh, an investment in kids is an investment in New Mexico's future. I've supported two avenues to make sure we're adequately funding early childhood ed and child care and the kind of resources needed to support young families in the long run. Um, I have supported efforts to uh, use our rainy day fund, our land grant permanent fund to think about long term strategies to resourcing early childhood ed and care. I also was grateful to support this legislation sponsored by our local leader, leader House Majority Doreen Gallegos and Senator John Arthur Smith, who was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee that 
responsibly said, while we have money, we can reasonably put that aside to make sure early childhood ed is in this endowment of sorts so that we can pull money from that for the long run. Um, I supported the amount that we invested there in the 2020 session. While there were some adjustments made over the special session, as we work through a global recession and a global health pandemic, it remains to be seen um, where we're gonna continue find those resources. Okay. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on now to healthcare. And Micaela, this is for you to begin. What actions do you support to improve the accessibility and quality of healthcare in New Mexico, if any? Thank you. Um, and like I just said, I participated this morning in a meeting of the Interim Legislative Health and Human Services Committee. My background is primarily in healthcare policy and criminal justice reform. What I know first and foremost, as we come through a global health crisis and global pandemic, is that we have to find a way to adequately make sure that every New Mexican has insurance coverage that meets their needs, whether that be through the Medicaid system that we pull federal match dollars on or through the private marketplace. I've led efforts and passed legislation like House Bill 100 in this most recent session to make sure that we have the right tools um, over the marketplace and through the health insurance exchange to improve coverability and coverage as we move forward. Thank you, Beth. Yes, thank you so much. And I, I too agree that with the insurance, many years ago, uh, I was involved in a very horrific accident. I was broken literally from head to toe. I was four months pregnant, didn't walk for three months. So at, during that time, I relied on physicians who truly believe that the patient comes first. And our citizens deserve that same quality care to help them heal from their issues and their personal care needs. We need to remove the obstacles uh, that will ensure quality health care. I especially think that people uh, need to have an open opportunity who lack affordable insurance. And uh, possibly we need to take a look at the outdated Medicaid programs. Thank you, Thank Vicki. You. Uh, Beth, question to you. What should the legislature do to improve the New Mexico economy and ensure job growth? I love this question. Thank you, Vicki. I am so excited about the possibilities and the potential that New Mexico has. We not only have the one of the most beautiful states, we have attractive state and we can attract more businesses into our state by adjusting, first of all, of course, the social security tax. We need to also address those special interest groups uh, who are receiving um, special benefits, if you will. Uh, by every month, the, the government is paying them a check back for just being in our state. And we need to modify that and make it fair across the board that allows new businesses to come in without feeling the um, discrepancies or discrimination against their personal business. So I believe that there's a lot of avenue. I also believe there's an avenue that we can um, build new technologies in New Mexico. We have the laboratories, we have the schools, we just may, may need to utilize those uh, facilities. Thank you. Michaela, the same question to you. What should the legislature do to improve the New Mexico economy and ensure job growth? Sure, and certainly. I so much appreciate this question. Our small and local brick and mortar businesses are the backbone and, and the, the life of our communities across the state and certainly here in Southern New Mexico. What we've seen as we all work to survive and navigate this COVID-19 pandemic is that our small businesses deserve our support and deserve our loyalty. I was really proud to support both as an advocate and in the body um, a call to finally tax online sales, which is really important when we think about an equitable tax landscape. I'm proud to have run and passed legislation to establish centers of excellence at NMSU studying sustainable ag and three other higher ed institutions in New Mexico. But fundamentally, what I believe is that when we think about economic development, too often we're talking about trying to lure the Facebooks or Amazons of the world to set up shop and create some jobs here in town. And while those efforts are important, I know that long run and in the long term, it's about building and sustaining relationships with our local and small businesses who are the job creators okay. across New Mexico. Thank you. We'll move on now. And this question will begin with you, uh, Micaela. Do you favor the legalization of recreational marijuana in New Mexico? Explain. 
Thank you. Uh, for me, over many years in the work I've done as an advocate across healthcare policy and criminal justice reform issues, certainly decriminalization of marijuana and cannabis was my priority. Um, the drug war in this country has racist roots and lots of communities of color, specifically black and brown people have been locked up for the ways they've moved through street economies and cycles of poverty. So I'm grateful that with the leadership of Senator Cervantes, we have decriminalized cannabis in our state. As I look forward to proposals on the House Judiciary Committee where I sit, I'm gonna continue asking two questions, certainly workplaces and those of us driving on the road every day, like I drive around getting my kids through their lives, deserve to know that we have some thoughtfulness and cautions in place to make sure that when people are showing up at work or on our roads, um, they're in a place and, and, and in a sober mind to do so safely and to meet the expectations we hold together as a society. So I'm certainly open and interested in the idea, but I do think we need to answer some further questions as we go down this okay. road. Okay, thank you. Beth. Yes, thank you for this question. Um, you know, as we uh, go through life and we experience chronic pain and, and uh, age-related arthritis, we rely on medications that are play an important role in our daily functioning. And I believe cannabis has, a pro has been proven to be a, vi a viable med medication but as a role and, and a mother and a grandmother, I wanna protect my children and I wanna educate them on the dangers of drug abuse. And I believe also that marijuana is a mind altering drug. We already experience enormous amount of challenges with drugs and alcohol and, and uh, in fact, the accident I was involved in, alcohol related. Um, you know, our state has enough challenges. We don't even need to pursue this. I believe we need to be taking care of business and that is reforming our taxes, building better education and uh, building our um, economy back up, supporting our local businesses. And I don't care how many laws and bills go through and I don't care who sponsors them. I care about the people who really are affected by those bills. Thank you. Bills Thank you very much, Beth. Vicki. Next question for you, Beth. Yes. Should it be legal in New Mexico for a physician to assist a patient in dying? Explain. You know, um, I've witnessed four people die in my family and it is, it is not easy. It is very difficult to watch someone you love uh, suffer. But it, here again, this is an issue of not legal or illegal. It's an issue of moral or immoral. Um, this is the cycle of life, birth and death. And there are so many means we already have that can assist these people in a calm and peaceful. I know in my mother's case and in my mother-in-law, she, she passed very peacefully because of the uh, things that we already have in place. I don't think we need to put that burden on a doctor whose main goal is to, to sustain life. And so, no, I don't believe that assisted suicide uh, should be involved in our legislation. Thank you. Um, Michaela, the same question to you. Should it be legal in New Mexico for a physician to assist a patient in dying and explain? Thank you, Vicki. Absolutely. I believe in death with dignity. And I certainly say that when those of us um, have the courageous act in front of us to run for office and to be honored enough to serve in the state legislature, it's actually all about legality and illegality. And I never would want to send someone to Santa Fe that is going to impose their morals and their versions of what's right and wrong onto the rest of us. I believe as policymakers that we each can do and should hold our own moral beliefs and opinions about things like end of life options, but that it's our responsibility to trust and ensure that New Mexicans can make their own decisions about their bodies, their lives, and yes, even their deaths. Um, I'm in this work because a dear friend of mine, 37 year old like me, who's lived with cancer since she was 17, asked me to invest in these efforts so that someone like her, when her illness becomes terminal, when she has no options left, can hold on to some control and hopefully mitigate the suffering that she and her loved ones will feel um, at the end of her life. Okay. Again, this is about options, not a mandate. Thank you very much. 
We move on now to our next question, Michaela. Do you support any adjustments to current gun regulations? Explain. I'm really proud, Fred, of the work myself and many have done in the last couple of years to prevent gun violence in New Mexico. As someone that's talked openly about living with mental illness, um, living with suicidal ideations, and living through an intimately and very violent uh, personal situation and relationship in my life, it means a lot to me that both we can uh, respect the rights of responsible gun owners, including lots of people in my family and people I love, uh, but also think thoughtfully and with careful consideration about what it means to prevent gun violence. I have little ones in school. I have little ones that have lived through real lockdowns in which I get texts as a member of the body saying, mama, there's a lockdown at school. And I am so, so, so scared. I'm proud that over these last couple of years, I voted in favor of red flag laws so that we can prevent situations like Parkland in which people knew that there was a student that wasn't at his best, that was feeling dangerous inclinations and unfortunately acted upon them. Okay, I know we thank can you. Respect gun rights and keep people safe. Thank you, Beth. You know, I, I am in somewhat of agreement. Um, I believe that gun rights are, are the Second Amendment rights to every uh, American citizen. I also believe that the red flag law took away that right. We no longer have those rights. And I also believe that American citizens are being blamed for mental health uh, because they own a gun. So owning a gun is not uh the answer or taking away a gun is not the answer to uh mental health we need to address mental health with doctors with education and we also need to protect our children and educate them on gun safety i i believe so much that we are beginning to take so many rights away from our families and our members and our communities that we are actually suppressing them and not helping them I am so for supporting our, our law enforcement and encourage the safety of our schools. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. I okay. care de desperately about them. Thank you, Vicki. Okay, next question, Beth. Should New Mexico pr promote renewable energy? If so, how? Um, you know, energy is, is one of the greatest resources that we have in our state. We have natural inter, natural uh, resources such as oil and gas. We have sun and wind, and we have also biogas and hydrocarbon. And I believe with research and development, we can combine these resources to come up and be the leading state in the initiative of energy. And we can take that energy and uh, build on jobs and build on more uh, businesses. I don't think that just uh, isolating one energy over another is uh, just cutting our nose off to spite our face. Thank you. Michaela, same question to you. Should New Mexico pr promote renewable energy? And if so, how? Certainly, thank you. I believe in science. Climate change is real. I know that, I feel that. We can see that as, as thoughtful adults looking around the world in 2020. What's really important to name here is that there needs to be a distinction between the consumption of energy in New Mexico. So that's what electricity we use when we turn on our lights, what natural gas we use when we heat our homes, et cetera, and the extraction of the incredible resource we have in the Permian Basin and other parts of New Mexico that's part of building our general fund budget. I certainly believe and trust and know that as consumers, we must move our state to renewable sources, and I'm proud to have supported the Energy Transition Act that does though, and also done things like sponsor legislation that uh, offer an electric vehicle tax credit. On the other side of that, I'm a pragmatist, and I know that about half our budget in New Mexico comes from oil and gas revenues. So I certainly have worked and demonstrated that I'm a responsible and responsive partner in hand with the oil and gas industry. So that okay. while- Okay, we, we have time for, thank you very much. We have time for one more question and we are very tight on time. Micaela, what is the role of the state, if any, in abortion regulation? Uh, thank you, Fred. 
Uh, like I've said on end of life options, I absolutely and fully trust New Mexicans to make their own decisions about their bodies and lives. It is not the place of someone to insert or assert their own religiously held belief or moral belief around the intimate and complex decisions we as people and New Mexicans face every day. This is no more true than when we think about access to abortion. Abortion is health care. I've worked to protect and expand access to abortion in my career, and that will hold as I move through this. What's also important for me running in 2020 is that we think about all the ways families are struggling, are worried up at night about how to pay their bills, about how, how to access the health care coverage they need. I'm really proud that in my freshman term, I passed a new bill that was signed into law that caps insulin prices for those loved ones of ours that are, are living with diabetes. This is life-saving medicine. Uh, my opponents across the aisle fought me every step of the way. Okay. So I know when thank it comes you. to abortion. Thank you, Micaela. We're out of, we're out of time. Uh, uh, Beth, we'll move to me. you now. Yes, thank you for asking me that question because this is a subject very dear and near to my heart. And I'd like to share, you see these tiny little feet? These feet are about three eighths of an inch long and they belong to a little body, a little body of its own, not the body of the mother, but its own body. This little, these little feet have fingers, they have toes, they have a heart, they have ears, nose, and their heart can be, de de be detected as early as four weeks. This little body is not the same body as the mother. It has its own DNA, its own special fingerprint. And I believe, as I have said before, I am not imposing my religion. I am imposing a natural law, immoral or moral, right and wrong. Laws cannot tell us what's right and wrong. We have to go by what we believe as truth. And I believe as every single Democrat voted for the most hideous bill that came across the table, HB 51, that allows abortion up to and including the time of death. Beth, I think that's a very dangerous Beth, precedent. And we, it tells people that New Mexico does not, Beth, support, we are, uh, does not believe in the we sanctity We are of life. out of time. Thank you for joining us for election 2020, also, New Mexico House District 33. Thanks to the candidates, Micaela Cadena and Beth Miller and my co-host, Vicki Simons. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a good week.